ಘನಪತಿಗಂ ಹವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿಂ ಕವೀನಾಮುಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ಥಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣಸ್ಪತ ಆನಶೃಂವಂತಿಧ ಸಾಧನ ಮಹಾಗಣಪತ ನಮಃ ಪ್ರಣೋದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವಾಜೇಭೀರ್ವಾಜಿನೀಭತಿ ಹೀನಾಮ ವಿತ್ರಯವತು ವಾಗ್ದೇವ್ಯೈ ನಮಃ ಅಖಂಡಮಂಡಲಾಕಾರ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿತ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓ um good afternoon from new york i'm here sitting in the hallway of our apartment building there's the exit door there are the elevators if anybody needs to leave um and um we i guess are in um i've been inside since march 17th when i got back from india new york is quite hit hard with um the uh, the coronavirus i didn't look at our numbers today but yesterday we had 106000 cases in new york and 6 or 7000 people have died in new york already so um the it's quite quite severe here there's a lot of stress as there is all over the world um and um there are a lot of different types of lockdowns which are occurring right now some of them are Uh, are quite privileged lockdowns like myself where we have a nice apartment even though it's small and we have food and i can still connect with people over the internet and there are many people around the world who are in lockdowns who don't have food or don't have internet there are 17 million people in america have lost their jobs already so the um job economy is quite tanked so it's a, it's a very difficult and painful time for most people um and um so we're pretty lucky we can connect on this level and spend time with each other doing yoga or talking about yoga having yoga classes online and things like that um so uh, i'll talk just a, a couple of minutes about um stress in the nervous system and i'll talk in, in very generally speaking and then a little bit more targeted Uh, in regards to specifically the times that we're dealing with right now um and again if i say anything that anyone doesn't understand or you have a question i know we have a variety of languages here right now just go into the chat box and type a question and i'll see it and i'll clarify whatever i've said um we have a we've evolved as a species um into these complex beings over uh, several million years um is starting off as single celled amoebas and even as single cell structures we would move away from danger and we would move towards nourishment and that's how cells and amoebas and bacteria have lived on this planet from the first time they existed here was a movement away towards something that was going to threaten our existence and a move towards that which will encourage our existence which is nourishment safety and as being started developing into multicellular organisms and then complex cellular organisms like we are and most of the people we've maintained within us this cellular instinct to move away from danger and to move towards safety and this system which is developed is our nervous system which mediates how we monitor our entire internal environment and how we monitor it in conjunction with the outer environment that we live in so the nervous system basically is coordinating all of the communication and dialogue from our cellular network which is 37.2 trillion cells approximately it's organizing all of that communication within our body our cellular body with the outer environment with the world outside 
And so how does it do that? It does that through patterns and rhythms, through our sense organs and through the endocrine glands and complex mechanisms such as the immune system. So it's a, a small example of how our nervous system is gonna keep us in harmony with a changing outer environment um, and, and, and protect us from what the environment might, might throw at us is the sleeping and waking cycle. This is a very basic one, a very simple one, where when it gets dark at night, we know to go to sleep. And when the sun comes up, we somehow know to wake up. And the way that works is we have a nucleus in our brain, it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And what it's doing is it's monitoring the movement of the sun. And that's what this nucleus in our brain does. It monitors the, the movement of the sun and it knows when the sun comes up knows when the sun goes down, and when the sun goes down and it gets dark, it sends a signal to the pineal gland to release melatonin, and the melatonin is released through our entire body, and it goes to every cell, and that induces sleep. And then in the morning time, when the sun begins to rise, a different signal is sent um, through a different axis in the brain that eventually ends up with the adrenals that releases cortisol, it wakes us up. So we have energy and a high level of cortisol when we wake up and gradually through the day that will go down until it's time to go to sleep. So these mechanisms aren't happening in isolation. It's happening because our body is responding to the, to the environment, to the world around us, to the movement of the sun and the moon. Um, the same type of things are going to happen with seasonal change. For example, when it starts to get um, springtime and summertime, the excess seat that we store in the body gets released. Um, when it's wintertime, our body will start to conserve heat. Uh, even if we just go outside and suddenly it turns very hot, we'll begin to sweat, so we release excess heat from the body. So these are the ways that the body is matching itself with the changing external environment. Okay, so why is it doing that? Well, from a yogic perspective, um, we have a physical body which we identify as, as being ours, as my body, the home that I live in. And then we also have an external physical body, and the external physical body is the world around us. So all the elements of the world are existing within our body as well. Our bones, for example, are the earth element. They're stable. Um, they're, they're the most fixed part of our body as the bones is the most endurable and long-lasting. Uh, we have the element of water in us, which is in our blood and in our lymph and in the plasma. And that's about 70% of our body is water. You all know these things. Um, we have fire in the body, like the same fire that we're created out in the world. We have in our digestive system and our ability to perceive form and shape. We have um, uh, air in the body, which is the exchange of gas. And then we have space, which is the space within every atom of the body. Um, so the external world around us and the internal world of our body are an extension of each other. We are made of the elements and we are made of the earth and we exist as an expression of nature even though we quite often think that we are separate from nature. So when we are completely in tune with nature and we're in harmony with nature and in harmony with ourself, then our nervous system is gonna function in a particular way where it feels safe and connected. But when we feel that we are separate from nature and that nature is threatening our existence because we recognize our body is ours and the world is separate, we will begin to perceive threat when something is threatening our existence. Um, the branch of the nervous system which perceives threat is called the sympathetic nervous system. And it has developed over all of these millions of years for the very purpose of perceiving threat, of empowering you to action, and causing us to be in a state whereby if we are threatened by something, we can move away from it or fight against it. That's what's known as fight or flight. But it's not the only thing the sympathetic nervous system does. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system also moves us towards activity. Um, for example, when you stand up and walk across the room to get a cup of coffee, your sympathetic nervous system is going to move you to do that. 
Um, so it's not only fight or flight, it's any activity-based thing. So over all of these millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years as human beings, um, we have developed this capacity to perceive threat so that we can survive. And that's the basic thing that's going on. Uh, we can perceive threat in such a way that it, we have a real threat that we see, or we can have imagined threats that we see. Sometimes the imagined threats also will keep us alive. So for example, um, if you live in a dangerous area, uh, in, say in the woods, and you know there's one particular stream where there are bears going every morning. You might go there once, almost get attacked by a bear, remember that that was a dangerous place, and never go back there again. Take a different route because you know this is a danger zone. So the way that our memory and our nervous system works together is that we have this something called a negativity bias where we experience something negative. It goes into our long-term memory very quickly so that we remember this thing is dangerous. If I continue to go in that direction, it will threaten my existence. So I'm going to go in, in, in a different direction. And so this is how we've evolved for a very, very, very long time. So now we find ourselves in, in a time, in a place where, um, where because we have such a, a heightened sense of threat um, perception that we can begin to, because our, we learn very quickly from danger, for example, if we have a negative experience, it goes into our long-term memory and sometimes less than a second, within one second that dangerous experience or traumatic experience goes into our long-term memory, and then it begins to frame how we look at the rest of the world. Something negative happens, it goes very quickly into the long-term memory, and now I look at the world through that lens, through that viewpoint. Um, when that happens time and time again, then very, very small things we begin to perceive as threatening an email might come in from someone we've had an argument with and we see their name in our inbox and we go, oh man, this is gonna be like a, a big problem. Or we get a text from someone who we had a disagreement with and automatically our body begins to respond as if we're being threatened. Um, someone looks at us funny and they weren't even looking at us funny, they just, you know, they had a headache or something. And we think, oh, this person is upset with me and then we react in a particular way. And so we begin, because we have such a fine threat perception, we begin to perceive threat all around us in the world where there might not really be threat. We perceive danger or anger or anxiety where it might not really exist. And this is what happens when the sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive, when it gets too turned up. But right now, with this entire coronavirus thing around the world, we're, we're very much in that kind of a situation. I mean, even before the coronavirus, the world was in, a, in an overstressed state. But now, with this virus, it's even worse. So what happens is, we begin to perceive that there's something dangerous out there, and that makes us stressed. So the sympathetic nervous system is the stress response. So we see these things happening all over the world, we read about the sickness, we read about the death, we read about the countries on lockdown, and that makes us feel stressed. And then as we expose ourselves to that stress every day by reading the news, and looking on the internet, and being stuck in our houses, and having to wear a mask outside, that stress begins to turn into fear, because that's what stress turns into when it stays for too long. It turns into fear. And then the fear, when it stays for too long, turns into panic. And then the panic turns into irrational behavior. Irrational behavior is what we've also seen all over the world with people you know, in America hoarding toilet paper and buying more groceries than they need and, and grabbing up every supply with the fear that there won't be enough left for them to do what? To survive. So it's a survival instinct which has gone completely haywire. It's a survival instinct, which has just been allowed to run and go for it, it gets turned on. And what this is, is this is the sympathetic nervous system acting as an accelerator. So everyone knows, 
how to drive here, most likely. And in a car, you have an accelerator and you have a brake. Basically, what our sympathetic nervous system is, is it is our accelerator. And it's good to have acceleration when you need it. But what we don't want is we don't want acceleration happening all of the time. So, because then you have a car or a nervous system which is out of control. So what do we need to do? We need to begin stepping on the brake. And the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the complementary branch of our nervous system, that's our braking mechanism. So what's happening in very stressful situations, and again, even before the coronavirus, the world was on sympathetic overdrive. We're moving too fast. Um, we have all the high-speed internet. So many things we have to do during the day. We have so much stress and demands on us and, and content on the internet, like there's too much. This is speed, it's all going too fast. And so what we need to do is we need to begin to slow ourselves down by stepping on the brake. The brake of the nervous system is called the parasympathetic nervous system. 80% of that is something called the vagus nerve. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system is rest, repair, restoration, and things like digestion and sleep. So if we need to repair or restore ourselves, we need this other branch of the nervous system to be a little bit more active. We need the sympathetic to down-regulate, we need the parasympathetic to up-regulate. So the good news is, is we have easy ways and easy mechanisms for doing this because our nervous system is expressing itself through our entire physiology, through our body, through our emotions, through the mind, and most prominently through the breath. So the inhale is going to be a function of our sympathetic. The exhale is a function of the parasympathetic. When we need to step on the brake, the best thing to do is to begin focusing on our exhales, lengthening the exhale. Even bringing conscious awareness to the breath with a little more focus on the exhale, we'll begin to slow down the sympathetic and make the braking mechanism stronger. So physiologically what's happening is when we go into sympathetic overdrive, uh, it's not that we have an acceleration problem. The problem is that our braking mechanism, the parasympathetic, the braking mechanism is temporarily impaired. And so all we need to do is get over that temporary impairment and begin to press on the brake to get it working again, and automatically the accelerator will lift up. But one of the things about yoga, which is so highly effective for this, um, if you're practicing Ashtanga yoga, you have basically an equal emphasis between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic through inhale and exhale being of equal length. So when you have this equilibrium of length between the inhale and the exhale, especially when you slow your breath down, that equilibrium also acts as a balancing force and it begins to reset the entire nervous system. Uh, and particularly the part of the nervous system that it starts to reset uh, when it's done consciously is our homeostatic functions. And homeostasis is the um, ability of our body to restore itself to balance. And this is an internal mechanism. It's part of, of who, who we are and why we have evolved the way we have. That we have this mechanism to restore to balance, to come back to a center point. And our body uses a lot of energy to do this throughout the day. When we breathe, inhale and exhale equally, and especially at the end of the practice for finishing poses and the closing sequence in Padmasana, when we focus on slowing down the breath and making these two equal, this makes our two branches of the nervous system begin to come into an equilibrium. And then homeostasis resets, you feel anchored back within yourself, restored to yourself, and you're back at your reset point. And then you're ready. So, and then the trick is then, is to say, well, you know, how can I maintain this throughout the day? I might reset myself in my practice and feel great for the first 15 minutes after yoga, but then little by little, things begin to speed up again during the day. And as they begin to speed up, I start to lose it a little bit. So what do I do? Okay, so 
Is everybody with me so far? Everything's okay? Any questions before I move on? Max, you happy so far? All right, no problem? Yeah, before was little sound less, but now it's much better. So I try to check something here, but it's nothing from my side. So I think it's okay. okay any other questions come up, just put them in the chat room. So now we have, we have step one, which is okay. I know what stress is. Stress is my nervous system responding to the environment. If something is threatening to me in the environment, my nervous system will respond in a particular way. Technically, what it does is it releases adrenaline and cortisol, which are stress hormones. This is a stress response. So that's what stress is. Um, it's neutral. Some stress is going to be positive. So for example, doing yoga is a positive stress. If you do it right, it's a positive stress, which is going to strengthen your nervous system, strengthen your physical body, strengthen your emotional body, strengthen your ability to stay present. So, and in order to do that, you need to be challenged a little. So challenge, or the Sanskrit word for challenge, is tapas. When you do something which is a little bit difficult in order to force yourself to stay present. Um, now, when, when there's too much coming at you and your system can't handle it anymore, that's when the stress response begins in a negative way. So a positive stress is called eustress. This is a good stress. It's a stress that we find exciting and challenging and motivates us to learn, to grow. And then in negative stress, when there's too much of it, this is called distress. And this is when things start to fall apart and the stress hormones go, go too much. So one of the ways that we can begin to deal with the stress that becomes too much during the day is we begin to reframe it. We change our perception of what stress is by understanding the mechanism of how it works. And if we say, I now understand and I know what stress is, it's my body's response to a changing environment, but that not all stress is bad, then you can begin to reframe your perception of stress that stress is good, stress is a challenge, stress is gonna make me grow. Um, there's nothing wrong with feeling a little bit of stress as long as I know how to deal with it when I'm facing it. And part of knowing how to deal with it is that when it becomes too much, because you've changed your perception of it, you can identify when there's too much of it. And then you say, this is too much, I need a break. I'm gonna walk away from this situation for a few minutes and take a few deep breaths. I'm gonna take a walk around the apartment because I can't take a walk around the block. And so little by little, we begin to catch the stress triggers that come our way more quickly so we don't go into overdrive, but we can pull back. And in that way, we then put ourselves back in the driver's seat of the nervous system. So number one, understanding the mechanism of what stress is. Number two, reframing stress, reframing it so we have a new perception that stress is not bad. Stress is neutral. In fact, quite often it's good. It can help us grow. And then we understand how to work with it. Okay, so those are the, the two first parts of um, working with stress and the nervous system. Um, any questions about that stuff so far? Good, okay. So, um, John, you want to add anything? Say anything? I'm I'm spellbound. I'm totally spellbound. <laughs> no, we just listen. Um, yeah, I can I can add a few extra things. Do it, man. Okay. There's a that very technical scientific uh, part of the brain that tells you that the sun rises and sun sets, and the moon rises and the moon sets is all one of your beautiful malas. One of, the, one of my biggest memories is your quote in Patabi Joyce's book that his yoga mala is as sacred as a prayer. And so often my work goes back to the teaching that I received from Patabi Joyce. And for me, that sunrise, that sunset is one full vinyasa. Beautiful. And so there's a beautiful full vinyasa in there. To then add on to that, Patabi Joyce said, if everybody was just to do Surya Namaskar, then their life would be 
um, healthy, fit, and full of contentment. So just to add to the nervous system, in my own personal exploration, what I've played with is the terms free breathing and ujjayi. And so I'd like to slightly, uh, ch not challenge you, but debate with you um, the equal inhalation exhalation. So if we take Surya Namaskar A first and look at Surya Namaskar A, it has nine vinyasa. And I remember saying to Guruji, 10. And he said, no, nine. Samastadihi. So Samastadihi is not a number, but it is still a vinyasa. So if we look at Surya Namaskar A, there's nine vinyasa plus one is 10. Of which number six, shat, is the state where we do five breaths. The state is static. The connective vinyasa into and out of shat are dynamic. So when we were talking about the inhalation being sympathetic and the exhalation being parasympathetic, yes, correct in my understanding, in my own personal uh, experimentation. In the Ekam Dwey Trini Chitwari Pancha Shat, that's dynamic meditation. Mm -hmm. And then the five breaths, one, two, three, four, five breaths in the downward dog, Shat, are static breaths. And so I've explored that in my Surina Muscare, my inhalation is shorter, than my exhalation on Ekam Dwaitrini Pancha Shat. When I get to Shat, I then make the inhalation exhalation equal. So the dynamic meditation is the positive stress. The static meditation is the sympathetic nervous system coming and balancing it out. And so if we have a look at this, if we have a look at a ratio, there's 10 breaths, yes, in Surinamaskare in terms of vinyasa of which five are inhales and five are exhales. If we look at the five breaths in the downward dog, that's 10 breaths, five inhales and five exhales. So we look at a ratio through Surya Namaskar A, the ratio is one to one in the sympathetic parasympathetic ratio. So Surya Namaskar A is very balanced. If you work that out, there is free breathing through Ekundwe Trini Pancha Shat, Sapta Ashto Nava Samasthiti. In that free breathing, you can allow the breath to fluctuate so you're not stressing yourself out in terms of trying to make that inhalation the same length as the exhalation, especially when Sapta and Chatwari are different to Ekam or Nava. So when we look at the, when we look at the equation there, we've got um, this dynamic, sympathetic firing system and then we have the parasympathetic uh, balancing system in the state of the asana so this is the pattern that will reflect further on through all of the states so i've been playing eddie with the terminology of free breathing and ujjayi so the ujjayi is the uh, equal inhalation exhalation that happens in the state interestingly enough if we use the same formula for surya namaskar b we almost go to a one to two ratio. Because Surya Namaskar B is 17 plus one is 18 vinyasa. And if we've got 18 vinyasa, it's only two short of 20, yeah? If we have five breaths in the downward dog, it's still 10. So it's 18 dynamic to 10 static. So you can see in Surya Namaskar B, that's why the heat comes up more because we actually step on the gas, as you say, a little bit more in Surya Namaskar B. Then what's really interesting when you go from a one-to-one -one, uh, sympathetic parasympathetic to a two-to-one parasympathetic, and then you go to Padangushtasana. In Padangushtasana, you've got less vinyasa to the state. And so... In Padangushtasana, it should be sterasukha. It should be steady, balanced, comfortable, and ujjayi breathing in the state. Can I pass that to you, Eddie? Sure. Um, what do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, 
Uh, how do you feel about the terminologies? First of all, free breathing Ujjayi. Okay. Um, so um, the, the free breathing, what I understood that to be was that your inhale and exhale are still an equal length, but that can change depending on what you're doing. So, for example, in some poses, you might be inhaling and exhaling for only two seconds because it's a harder pose. Yeah. Uh, some, you might be inhaling and exhaling for 10 seconds because it's an easier position to hold yourself in. Um, and um, so that's how I took the, the free breathing to be that you always kept an equal ratio the best you could, but that, um, but that was going to change depending on the posture or the level of activity or how fast you were moving. Yeah. So um, that's, but I, li I like what you said. Everything was great. And because um, you like math so much. <laughs> so, I like sacred geometry too, but anyway, Eddie, this is, this is your talk. Sorry. <laughs> this is, this is fun. We, we can talk together. Um, um, the one thing about if you do three Surya Namaskar A and you do three Surya Namaskar B and you count each breath of those, that will add up to 108 breaths. Um, and so therefore, if you wanted to do a, a, a full mala of mantras with each breath of your Surya Namaskar, you could get to 108 just by doing three and three. Fantastic. Yeah, that's super cool, right? And because um, you remember we used to ask Guruji why three, you know, sometimes it was five and five, sometimes three, and he would say, well, um, you know, one mandala is 48, and half of 48 is 24, and half of 24 is 12, half of that is six, half of that is three. So all the proportions that you do should be within one mandala because that's a complete cycle of consciousness. And then within each of those, it's amazing how you can get to 108 breaths with the sun salutation. So that, um, I'll do the mass <laughs> tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. That's a nice little, that's a nice little um, uh, inquiry for me to, to play with tomorrow. Thank you. I'll, I'll count my 108. So, um, okay, so, and then you, whenever you want to add something in, John, just go ahead. Um, yeah. um, so we were at this idea of the breaking mechanism of the, of the nervous system and, uh, and how breathing does that um, and how practice does that as well. So we'll just talk a moment about the vagus nerve then, which is um, about 80% of our parasympathetic nervous system is something called the vagus nerve. Um, it comes from the Latin word um, vagus, which means to wander, like a vagabond wanders. And from the cranial nerves, we have 12 cranial nerves coming out from the base of the cranium. 10 of those, or 11 of those, mainly go to one or two places, like they go to the eyes or the ears, or they go to the mouth or the corner of the eyes, or just the pupil to the olfactory nerves, to the sense of smell, and some of them come to the tongue and, and some just go to the shoulders. And that's where the cranial nerves go, control muscles and movement and sense organs above the neck. Now the vagus nerve travels below the neck down to the heart, it goes through the trachea, the voice box, it goes into the heart and the lungs, it goes to the diaphragm, and it goes to the spine to the liver, to the pancreas, and to the intestines. And what it does is it picks up messages from the entire visceral body and send those messages back up to the brain to let the brain know what's going on down in the body. Um, and then allow the brain to respond to that. So for example, if you've ever had a gut feeling, you get nervous and you have butterflies in your stomach or you're in a dangerous area and you feel there's danger around you and your stomach tightens up, this is actually um, your, your, the viscera of your nervous system in the abdominal region responding to threat because it perceives it and sending those messages up to the brain for the brain to respond what to do. Um, your body will feel and notice these things even before your brain makes sense of them and turns it into a thought. So feeling uh, and sensing is going to precede a conscious thought about, oh, 
this is a danger, I need to go the other way. Sometimes if a car is speeding towards you, you'll jump out of the way without even thinking about it before you can even have the thought, I should jump out of the way. Because your body and your nervous system are responding before conscious thought is coming into play. So the vagus nerve uh, will just cover a couple of interesting things about it since we only have uh, about 20 minutes left or so. And uh, I'd love to empower you man, to see it. Um, we're practicing social distancing from the elevator. So um, the, um, the couple of interesting things about the vagus nerve. Number one, um, Darwin was one of the first people to study the vagus nerve and he called it the nerve of emotion that we experienced emotions in the heart, and then those emotions would travel up the vagus nerve through the trachea, through the voice box and larynx, where we express vocal tone, and then through the face, where we have facial expressions to show emotions. We can say, how do we express and show emotions? We show them because of the activity of the vagus nerve. We feel something at the heart, and it goes through the vagal nerves in the heart, from the SA node, the sinoatrial node, and it goes up through our voice box where we modulate vocal tone to express emotion, and then it's shown on our face. So one of the ways that we are interacting with the world and having positive social connections is through the functions of this branch of our nervous system. Um, you can hear my tone of voice and hear if I'm angry or sad or happy or threatening, because of the tone of my voice, whether it's high-pitched or low-pitched, uh, high-pitched or low-pitched or sharp or soft, and then you can read on my face um, if, if I'm happy or sad or threatening or angry or whatever it is, um, by, you can see like, if I'm smiling and the corners of my eyes are smiling and my mouth is smiling, you know I'm genuinely happy. But if my mouth is smiling and I'm looking at you with a dead cold stare, you might know that a, you need to take a few steps back away from me and something is not quite right, that I'm not really smiling at you. So we read facial expressions, we hear tone of voice because of our vagus nerve. And you can perceive my facial expression and my tone of voice through your vagus nerve. And I can change my tone of voice and change my facial expression through my vagus nerve. So we are co-regulating each other's nervous systems and responding and reacting to each other because of this mechanism of our nervous system. Not because of it, but it's mediated through this mechanism. So as a species, we are co-regulating each other through our ability to share emotion, um, through vocal tone and through touch and through facial expression and through all of this, the, the invisible things that we read in body language. So when our vagus nerve is very toned, that means when the information is flowing well from the body up to the brain and back, um, then what happens is we can read these signals clearly. But when our vagus nerve is not toned, and the information flows are not moving well up and down through trauma or whatever reason, and we don't read social cues, and we have a harder time expressing emotion. Um, the, um, the vagus nerve, when we say the tone, it's not like the tone of a muscle. It's an information flow from the body to the brain and back from the brain to the body. So the vagus nerve also controls or mediates a lot of other important things within our physical body as well, too. So inflammation levels in the body, for example, are mediated and controlled through the vagus nerve. If we have high levels of inflammation in the body, it leads to inflammation in the mind, which will lead to anxiety and depression and hypertension. Um, when we have high states of inflammation in the body, it is also associated with higher levels of cardiovascular disease, higher levels of digestive disorders, more incidences of diabetes and cancer. So this is all linked to inflammation or overinflammation uh, levels in the body. This is all been this is all well studied, and there's a lot of research on this. Um, Ninety-five percent of the preventable non-communicable diseases that we have in the world today are associated with over-inflammation levels in the body. 
So um, when we have lower levels of inflammation in the body, that means that there is less incidence of cardiovascular disease, less incidence of anxiety and depression, less incidences of diabetes and cancer, um, and all the other non-communicable type things caused by inflammation. As well, when we have these um, uh, lower levels of inflammation in the body and lower levels of inflammation in the mind, we are able to be not only more, inter more connected inwardly through the sense of interoception or inward perception, but we're more outwardly connected as well. That the areas of our brain that are associated with first survival at the brainstem and then um, connection at the limbic system and then interaction at the uh, cortical levels of the brain, all of those are in a greater level of balance with each other. So we feel safety, we feel connected, and we feel content. And so from lower levels of information, inflammation and a balanced and harmonious movement of information through the vagus nerve, we have contentment, safety, and interconnection. And these are three of the things that, that define us as human beings. So what does this have to do with yoga? Um, the uh, scientist, Dr. Stephen Porges, who has proposed this polyvagal theory, which is quite a bit of what I'm talking about, um, has done research and has noticed through his, his studies that within religious traditions, there are particular things and spiritual traditions, particular activities that all have a tonifying positive effect on the vagus nerve. And um, one of these things is posture and the movement of posture. So for example, in uh, the Jewish tradition, when you pray, you rock your body back and forth. So this rocking of the body back and forth is going to um, send messages through the vagus nerve near the carotid artery where we are monitoring blood pressure to monitor blood pressure. And that's not the only thing it does, just from a physiological point of view. Uh, in the Sufi tradition, you have whirling, and whirling is, is very balancing as well for the vagus nerve. In Islam, you bow five times a day if you pray. Pray. Uh, in Christianity, you have kneeling and standing, kneeling and standing. Um, so this is one of the things he noticed from the religious traditions. The next was um, um, breathing, that when you're saying your prayers, you are also regulating your breath as you pray. And when you chant or pray, you're extending your exhale because you say something for longer and the extension of your exhale is going to be stimulating for the vagus nerve as well by pressing on the vagal brake to slow everything down. Um, the next is vocalization, and through positive vocalization, either of symbolic or non-symbolic sounds, you are stimulating and massaging the vagal nerves that are going through the larynx. And then last is behavior, that all of these religious traditions um, have practices of behavior, of positive behavior, it also have been shown to strengthen vagal tone. So the, um, the expressions of appreciation and gratitude and love all have been shown to strengthen vagal tone and improve heart, improve heart rate variability, which is the indicator of cardiovascular health. And anxiety and anger have been, excuse me, shown to weaken vagal tone, um, as well as cardiac health. So you have posture, breathing, vocalization, and behavior. And this is basically the first four limbs of Ashtanga Yoga. We have Yama and Niyama, where we find behavior and vocalization chanting. For example, Swadhyaya is the practice of mantras. And then we have Asana, which is posture. And then we have breathing, which is either the breathing we do within postures or pranayama practices. So the, whole, the first four limbs of Ashtanga Yoga are basically um, the psychophysiological practices to begin to balance our entire physiological system so that we're anchored and connected with ourselves and with our extended body, which is the world around us and all the people in it, and to prepare us then for deeper levels of cont contemplation and meditation that come from within dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. And pratyahara is the mediating point where we flow through with that. 
So um, from a, um, a physiological point of view and from the point of view of how we're dealing with uh, this times of stress that we're in right now, um, we can see that number one, if there's too much stress, it's going to weaken the tone of the vagus bigger, nerve. And if that nerve is weakened in terms of poor information flows, then we are not able to anchor within ourselves. But if we do the practices of yoga, specifically the first four limbs, we can re-anchor, reconnect, perceive ourselves in relation to the world properly, and then prepare ourselves for deeper levels of contemplation and meditation that will not cause any neurotic tendencies in us because we won't be escaping from a world that we are very comfortable to live in. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about the uh, nervous system and the vagus nerve in, in relation to yoga. And remember, the vagus nerve does not cause these things to happen. It's just a me mechanism we can see and measure where information flows, where invisible things are flowing. And so it's harder to work with the invisible than it is with the visible. So for example, our body is a lot easier to see and to mold than our mind. We can't see our mind. We don't know where it is, but we can feel and experience things going through it. And quite often, if you're having an angry thought or you're really upset about yourself, something, it's hard to say, don't be upset, don't be angry, and, and have that anger evaporate immediately. Because the mind is a little trickier. So you, you start to work first. We all start to work first with that which is, um, is physical and moldable and, and has sense and we can touch it and feel it. And, and then from there, we begin to go more subtle. So this entire mechanism of the first four limbs of Vashtanga Yoga is working with the visible to prepare ourselves so that we can work with the subtle and the invisible. Okay, so um, Don, you want to um, take it from there for a few minutes and <laughs> add anything? Uh, the vagus nerve. Um, so I can't even imagine. Um, now the vagus nerve's a bit out of my my dimension, actually. Uh, so um, I'm just I'm just uh, lapping it up, just enjoying your your talk. Uh, there's one other thing about the vagus nerve that will bring it into your dimension, um, uh, aside from the fact that you are an engineer by trade and a yoga teacher by skill and profession. Um, there are two people I've heard of who said that the Shishuna Nadi, where Kundalini moves through, was the vagus nerve. And one of those was a guy named Vasant Rele, who wrote a book called The Mysterious Kundalini. And he spoke about Shishuna being the vagus nerve. And the only other person who I heard say that was Patapi Joyce. Uh -huh. Very good. Thank you, Eddie. Thank wow. you. John and I have been friends for a long time. Like, <laughs> was it 1990 we met? No, because I didn't come to Mysore until 1991. And I went there that came we were there at a different time that year. Hmm. But I came in 1991 in January, and then I came back in 92. And yeah. that, that yes, I, I saw, I, I, I don't do uh, the social media very much, but uh, I did come across a, a beautiful Eka Padishir Sasana, someone had posted of Eddie Stern. Uh, it must have been 90 or 90, 91 or 92. And I went, wow, Eddie looked so young. <laughs> so that's a long time ago, Eddie. Uh, do you know who took that photo? Who? You. you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, a, it, it's obviously been reworked because it looked a different color. Um, it, was, it was so brown in that Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the only, this is a true story. Just about the only existing photos of, I have of me doing yoga, you took. <laughs> and the other ones were Holton, but that was before I did Ashtanga Yoga. So my only Ashtanga Yoga photos that I actually have were taken by you. Wow, Eddie, thank you. <laughs> and if we, could, if, we, if we could get connected to Holton, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah. I still haven't heard from Alt Holton. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, you guys have any questions from any of that material or thoughts or anything you want to add to it?
you know, by the way, times, Eddie, they were really special times. Thank you. They were, John, they really were. They really were. Those are times that will never be repeated. I mean, no time will ever be repeated, but they were really good times for sure. They were. Life was, life was different. Uh, how do I feel Ashtanga Yoga has progressed over the years? Um, well, uh, I'd have to say that um, in the years when John and I were practicing and um, you know, when uh, you know, Jocelyn, my wife, when we were all down there practicing and it was a small little yoga shala, um, things were, uh, we practiced really hard, but things were a little bit more easygoing in terms of like, you would see some different types of things happening in the room. Uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, we weren't doing lead classes at all. So there wasn't this sort of rigid idea that, that we had about stuff at the time. Um, that's my feeling. Uh, you know, John, you might have a different feeling about it. And I think that, um, you know, as things grew and as more people started coming, one of the problems with um, dealing with more people is that you have to begin to systema systema systematize things even more to make sure everyone's basically doing the same thing and basically doing things, quote unquote, the, the right way. Um, and um, uh, back then I didn't have quite as much of that feeling because it was smaller. And uh, with Indians practicing in the room with you, you know, they didn't practice in a way that looked anything like what we were doing at all. And um, so it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit more of a, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say a forgiving environment, but it wasn't quite so regimented. Uh, as it is now. So um, I think that where we are now is just a, a necessary result of what happens when things get really big. And, um, you know, and, and that's all. But I, I don't pine for the old days, you know, the old is gold kind of a thing. And it's just how it was. It was our moment in time. And for the people who are coming now, they also have a really super positive experience too. You know, not everyone who went to Mysore loved it. A lot of people went there, they did practice for a week, and then they said, forget this, and then I'm out of here. <coughs> um, but I don't really think about it too much. Um, John, you, you have any thoughts on that? Uh, for me, it hasn't really changed very much other than my own inner inquiry and developing more uh, in terms of my own internal research of what my teacher gave me. Um, and so I've, I've kept very, very much to myself and to the people that, that have just come to me. And so um, uh, my classes have still a lot of... Uh, um, the element that we had, there would be a, a climax of laughter or there'd be, um, uh, the, the tension would, would be released by, by Patabi Joyce taking a joke or something. Um, and so for me, the practice is, is to, in terms of what you're saying about it being possibly regimented nowadays, um, for me, my classes are still very light, still very uh, playful because for me, it's about passing to each person their own ownership of the practice for them to inquire into their own personal practice for them to, to find that joy. And so for me, there's still so much joy in the practice. Um, yeah, but it's also something that uh, I think you're really trying to do is to keep the numbers small, small in the classes, yeah. if it's possible, of course, if we can, we're really trying to keep a small group and then it's hard to, to talk about whole world of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga because you just have, you're holding one class. I guess we all have our different bubbles, Eddie. So the, you know, the, bu the bubble that I've created for Julia and I is, is as Julia says, we, we still work with no more than um, 14, 16 people in our retreats. If we're, not in if we're in Purple Valley, then we're in, you know, there's more people, but because of the coronavirus, we were down to 14 people again, and it was magic. It was really magic. Yeah, because it, for me, it's a, it's for me, for me, it's about the 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 relationship, you know, to to keep that that personal relationship between teacher and student. Beautiful, beautiful, really nice. Um, Jill wanted to know if 
Too much stress causes inflammation. Um, and the answer to that, Jill, is yes, stress does cause inflammation. Um, and uh, Hemorrhus wants to access the video again later, Max, to hear about John's math breathing tongue twister. <laughs> um, and Max said, how does it feel now to meet an old friend, John, here on Zoom? It's amazing to see two great teachers together. Well, it's very nice to see John again. We haven't seen each other in ages. But uh, it's, I think with old friends, it's like you never didn't see each other. I think the testimony is that we're still connected, Eddie, that uh, on one level, uh, we're very much carrying on with our work that we, we were gifted. And uh, although we haven't met in person, it's like it's just yesterday again, Eddie, to be with you. Um, so so uh, it's testimony that... The, the, the common element, the common cause, the, the coming to the level of consciousness. And it's lovely to see you, how you have, uh, have developed and grown in terms of, I mean, you were always slightly more academic and I was slightly more, um, like, I, I love when you talk to Chuck Miller and he would say 95% practice, 1%, uh, 5% theory. And uh, I got 99% practice 1% theory. And my joke is that Chuck, for example, he could handle 5% uh, theory where I could only handle 1% theory. Because <laughs> I'm more of a real practical guy. I really like to get in there and uh, do the experimentation on myself and, and be creative in terms of what I then put on paper. And I can see that your, your, uh, your personality it, it, it's forever Eddie, who, who is just so intelligent, and I love listening to you talk. So it's been a pleasure to be here with you, Eddie. Yeah, I think I'm probably um, a little bit more than 1% theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> There's a lot of 1%, though, Eddie. Yeah, I know, exactly. The 1% is relative. The, exactly. There's a lot of one percent, and I, I turn the phrase backwards. Yeah. I take take one percent theory and practice at ninety nine percent, and yeah, then all is coming. Yeah, I don't even I don't even use that phrase, um, and, and I can guarantee you guys, I definitely don't think about this stuff while I'm practicing. <laughs> 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 yeah. So let's see what else. Um, so to stimulate parasympathetic response, would you suggest we extend our exhale at some point in the practice? So only if you need to, uh, here's the thing. Um, when your nervous system comes back into what you could call a um, you know, balanced or homeostatic state, then you're bringing this equilibrium within again. And, um, and when that occurs, there's something called a resonance between some of your different physiological functions, in particular, your respiratory rate, your heart rate, um, and the part of you which is monitoring your blood pressure, which has, is intricately and intimately tied into your emotional states. Your blood pressure and your emotional states are tied into each other. If someone is angry and upset all the time, generally speaking, they have higher blood pressure. If they're anxious all the time, quite often, higher blood pressure. Not all the time. Um, so when you, when you have this resonance occurring between your respiratory rate, meaning your breathing pattern, how, hard your fa your, how, hard your, your, how fast your heart is beating, and what your blood pressure ratios are, when those call, all come into like the same synodial wave and they're all moving with each other at the same time, that's called resonance frequency. It's tied in with your brain wave patterns at the same time. And um, everyone has a different resonance frequency. So some people might have a resonance frequency where if you inhale for five seconds and exhale for five seconds for an extended rate, that gets you there. For some people, it's inhaling for four and exhaling for four. For some, it's inhaling for five and exhaling for seven. But generally speaking, it's going to be a rate where you're breathing somewhere between five to seven breaths per minute. Okay, so five to seven breaths per minute is basically 
going to get you into resonance frequency. And it could be any ratio for you. For some people, they might need to extend their exhale. And for some people, they, um, they might need to breathe evenly. So, um, for example, um, there were breathing ratios where Katabi Joyce used to say, you should stay in headstand at least for 10 minutes and breathe 50 times. And that means you're breathing five times per minute. That's resonance frequency. And so there were a bunch of different asanas where he used to give that kind of a, an explanation of the amount of minutes and the amount of breaths. And every time it would be resonance frequency. If the yogis knew all of this stuff, they just called it by something different. Um, and um, I'm interested in science and I do scientific research in, in, with universities. And so I like this language. So that's the one that I use. Um, but the yogis had this language for a really long time already. Uh, and, um, and they called it by different names. So all the stuff I'm talking about is, um, could be, I could be using the words Nadis and Ida and Pingala and Shishumna and all of that. And it would be basically the same thing in other terminology. Um, so, in regards to should you extend your exhale, the answer is it depends. You have to play around with your own breathing and get an interoceptive sense of what makes you feel calm, connected, centered, and, and focused. And, and that's the breathing rate that you should do. And it'll be different for, for each of us. Um, so um, let's see, we're almost out of time. Um, John, do you want to, uh, we can both talk about this one, but why don't you start with this one first? Um, I've had an unresolved issue with adjustments in Ashtanga. I've had a few experiences when I got hurt by assistance. I've always been trusting in the wisdom of the teachers, but then started questioning this and trying to work out whether to trust the teacher all the time. Sometimes you have a person whose energy does not agree with you. What to do then? And is it sometimes not easy to recognize the line between someone or yourself even challenging you in a positive way and hurting you or yourself? Do you have any advice on this? So what are your thoughts on that, John? Um, again, I'm in my own bubble, Eddie. Yeah, but we want to hear about your bubble. I'm in one too. So, so in my bubble, um, I've been very lucky that, as you said, I was an engineer, I was an industrial designer before I became a yogi. I was probably a yogi then as well, but uh, in, in a different layer. And so in, in my industrial design world, it was about problem solving. And so problem solving was always inquiring what was happening. And when I went to Mysore and started to practice with Patabi Joyce, it was very physical. And I was adjusted by Patabi Joyce in every asana from Surya Namaskar right through all of the asanas that I do. And my first, first visit to Mysore, there was only eight students in the room and that first year, the total went down to four. I was one of four students. And when I left, Patabi Joyce said, um, you go home and you now you do self-practice. And he told me to take eight breaths in each asana. During the time with him, he said, in Mysore, I put your body in the position. And when you go home, body remembers. So my body um, was being put in the position along with the nervous system. And so uh, with the, the drishti, the, the free breathing, the ujjayi breathing, the relaxing, my body was definitely recording what was actually happening physically. Along with that, because I was a designer uh, and also because the, the, there was space in the room, I used to sit and watch the adjustments. So I saw the adjustments from the outside. I felt the adjustments and my nervous system processed them. And this happened through my whole time uh, working one-to-one -one with Patabi Joyce. So when I then teach, that's what I pass on. And so when, when I did have a period of doing teacher trainings, 
that was passed on to those that were on the teacher training. And one of the requirements that we had during the teacher training was that they all had to adjust to me. And so in order to get through the training, they had to adjust their teacher. And so we had this uh, biofeedback loop where there was just complete openness in terms of that was a bum adjustment. That just did not work. That was dangerous. That was too hard. It was insensitive. So during the years of, of, of those teacher trainings, I then developed a system where we started doing blind practices. So the students would practice blindfolded. And then we would adjust the students that were blindfolded. So that meant the adjuster was anonymous. So they wouldn't be judged. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we also then flipped it. We flipped it that the um, student was then without blindfold and the teachers or the student teachers were blindfolded. And so you, we were adjusting with blindfolds. Um, and what this developed was a, a, a level of sensitivity in terms of touch um, and a level of sensitivity in terms of uh, two bodies becoming one. And so um, if you haven't started with a teacher that's had that sort of training, uh, if, you, if, if you're going and dropping into classes where you have no idea of the teacher's track record, what their training's been, then you're, you are vulnerable. But uh, especially too, if you already arrive having a practice, if you start with a teacher from the beginning, this is the problem that we, we're able to shop around, especially now online, we can shop around on whoever we want to go to. Um, in the physical realm, when you shop around physically with all your teachers, you don't get a continuum. And that continuum is really important from the day one that you start with your teacher. And so like you and I, Eddie, we had, we had Patabi Joyce as our, as our core or root teacher that we went through with. I may have been um, sightseeing a few times, but that never took me away. I always came back to the path that I was on. Um, and so that's really important that if you, if you start with a teacher from the beginning and follow that journey through. If you're arriving at a, a teacher, then you, you are giving yourself in that sense to the teacher that you're in their class so you you um, follow if it doesn't seem feel right then you have to leave you have to take the ownership of your self your own practice and I call it adhikara uh, adhikara being to reclaim one's own purusha or to reclaim one's own sovereignty and that that the practice is about um, reclaiming your own sovereignty and so therefore uh, if you are a student that's, that's feeling that you're not able to trust your teacher or you're being injured by a teacher, you have to leave. You, it's your, it's your uh, right to, to, to leave and find another teacher. But you need to do your um, due diligence and find out what's the track history of the teacher, what the teacher's experience is, and all those sorts of things. I mean, because... Um, if you're if you're putting yourself in that position where your body's vulnerable, um, then it's your responsibility. I haven't really given an answer there. I've just sort of gone around a little bit, Eddie. So maybe you can put that together a little bit better for me. Well, that's beautiful. Um, and um, you know, part of the uh, guru tradition in in India is that the student is actually educated on how to judge uh, and be discriminating about the teachers that they choose. And something which is built into the Hindu tradition is that a student is taught the ways to be discriminating about the teachers they choose because the guidelines and the description of what the teacher should do and how they should behave is built into their education. Um, we didn't get that you know, in the West as Americans or Westerners going to India and then learning from gurus. Um, we weren't given that kind of a background, but in the Hindu tradition, it's, it's a very deep part of it. Um, so, you know, I'd say just in, I think that you answered Ilana's question very nicely. She's happy with it. She said, thank you, John. Um, and uh, I would um, agree with you that if you feel signals that this person is not the right teacher for you, then, um, then, you should listen to those signals and then you should 
make your way onward to the person who you, you feel right with. Mm -hmm. uh, we often don't listen to the signals that, that we have because we think, oh, it's okay, you know? This is how it's supposed to be. Um, and part of, you know, part of, of this whole thing actually I've been talking about, even in terms of, you know, this sense of interoception of being able to listen inwardly, is listening to the signals. And, um, and, and we need to have someone let us know it's okay to listen to those signals that we feel, um, that they might be telling us something that we need to listen to. Um, but often we don't. And I've been, you know, many times in my life where I've not listened to the signals and I've regretted not listening to them. My flags have gone up, but somehow I was compromised inside and I didn't pay attention to the flags. So if you see a flag going up for yourself, I would say, look at that flag, you know, see, what, see which direction it's blowing in the wind and, and follow that. Um, so JD wanted to know if you could send a message to young Eddie one year into Ashtanga Yoga, what would you tell him? <laughs> tell him to get a haircut. <laughs> well, uh, I have to go in a minute, guys, but I would say uh, the, the thing that I always say, I would have told myself looking back, uh, I would say two things to me. Number one, I would say, don't start teaching too soon. I started teaching way too soon. Um, I had been doing Ashtanga Yoga only a year and a half before I started teaching. And um, even though I had already, I'd finished third series and I was starting on the fourth one, and Patabi Joyce gave me permission to teach when I asked him if I could start teaching, that was the biggest mistake I ever made in my yoga career, was starting to teach too soon. If I could tell myself anything, I'd say practice for a good 10 years before you start teaching and then see if you still want to do that. And now the additional thing that I would tell myself was not only should you not teach for about 10 years, but you should go to college and get a university degree. That's what I would tell myself. And because I would have been me, I wouldn't have listened to either of those things. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, beautiful people, I, I have to go. Um, I'm really sorry, I only had it scheduled until 12 o'clock and um, I, I have a, um, a meeting I'm 15 minutes late for. Uh, this was really, really uh, wonderful to see you, John, and to meet you, Julia. Uh, so Very nice to meet you. you. We used to have so much fun just hanging around the Kaveri Lodge and hanging out and Nagaratnas and at my uh, mess hall, eating food and talking about yoga. It's all we did all day long in India for years. We just talked about yoga and did yoga and thought about yoga and nothing else. So we should do this again. It's really, really pleasant to be here talking with you. Maybe it's a good beginning, you know, that in every good there is something bad and in every bad there is something good. So this lockdown can be... Uh, a good beginning of blossoming and so on, of something new. Thank you, Eddie. Thank, you. thank you, Max, for, for <laughs> first of all contacting <laughs> us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, John, for a super surprise. Thank you, everyone. Uh, traditional, we try to put uh, microphones to everyone in one second and just say thank you. Will be a little mess, but okay, we don't worry. So. <laughs> Um, Max, thank you for organizing this and pulling us all together. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, yes, this is the one. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Bye to everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 Interesting. Very, very yeah. nice. Uh, interesting. Uh, Thank you. We will wait for more. Oh, you more. should record <laughs> a bomb beginning, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the in the building here? So now you know the, the John, John and the I was this. Uh, Maybe you can check the uh, surprise yeah. today. I want to hear about the building during. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Okay, has then having this really. All right. With, uh, <laughs> Susanna. Susanna. Oh. Bye, Jacob. Bye. Bye. Max, thank you. Thank you. Mary, Max. thank you. America, Italia, Thank you, Susanna. Bye. Bye. We love okay. you so much. Bye, Susanna. Thank you. Bye, Judy. Hey, Charlie. And Poland. Wow. <laughs> yes, Magda, Poland, of course. Hey, hey. <laughs> John, oh Julia. And South, South Africa. <laughs> Every place. I know. Yes, and India, of course, Digna. The India. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ciao Dina. Ciao. 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 Ciao Erika. Eccola. Ciao. Erika, vai also. Giovanna, come stai? Erika. Hi Erika. Oh. Ciao Larry. Ciao. Ciao Larry. And Max. <laughs> no? 24. Here 24 people. <laughs> Very good. Yes, who, who start conference, Larry? Okay, yes. yes. One, one hour now. more. What do you understand? <laughs> I don't understand a whole lot. I was, that was, that I was good. exciting to, to manage these windows. I don't know what I understand. I have to, I have to watch again, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This recording, I put on a Ashtanga somewhere on Facebook to, to watch okay. again. So you can. You that can would be yes. wonderful. Very yes, good. yes. Very we'll good. Be, <laughs> On my profile and Ashtanga Yoga Kalyari, you can you can watch again one more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds really, good. really thank you, Max. It was amazing. Really thank you, Max. No, thank you to to teachers and thank you to John because this was totally surprised. Uh, we have plan also organized with John Scott some you know, some conference, <clears throat> but he surprised me. He told me, Max, I won't join to to Eddie, uh, you know, in a lecture. So I was okay. Super nice for us, you know, like for me, everyone can come, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's like Prashad. <laughs> you get a sweet Prashad in the end, surprise. Yes. Yes, no lecture, but the nervous system. It's, uh, in internet is, uh, um, the argument is, um, uh, like but nervous system is different, but it's very interesting. Sure. Okay. We have to go. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye. Bye bye, 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 bye Larry. Bye Larry. Bye bye. Bye bye, Bye bye. Ciao. Nice Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. 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 Yes, now I stay in Jagger place. <laughs> yeah. I completely am lost. Other side. If not Jagger, I have to go from under under bridge maybe. He's <laughs> 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 my brother. He saved me. <laughs> <laughs> He's really